All right, today we're talking about nonsense, which means we're going to be talking about a religious ideology called nonsensticism. So do drop me a one in the comment to let me know that my audio is coming through correctly. And yes, we are streaming, so that looks good. I'm just getting up the comments here. Right, so yeah, thanks all for being here. Uh, Harry L. Johnson, Sergeant Grinch, Ben Yosef, thank you, good to see you. Uh, Joe J. Pierce, uh, the Golden Crusade, Eva, welcome, uh, is horse in the house. Uh, let's see, Johan, Crystals, 7-Eleven, Thunderous, of course, the great Thunderous one. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Mordecai and uh, Dodzor, God is my salvation. So welcome, guys. M. Defesa de Papa, welcome. Yep, so, and of course, a Greek name I absolutely positively cannot pronounce. I have no idea what that says. And Yaakov, welcome, of course. So today we're talking about nonsense and nonsensticism. And let me get to my notes. All right. Gnosticism is bad. How bad is it, you ask? It is so bad. It is so bad, it is using Wikipedia without double checking. It's that bad. So, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, Sergeant Grinch says, I need these lessons. I do not know anything about this subject. Andrew, welcome. Good to see you. So this series is designed, the, the, this probably will be two parts. I'm going to try to do 28 slides tonight. The aim is to make this simple, to simplify it, not as deeply in depth, not as complex as I, as I often go into. This is meant to be simpler so that it gives people a good, easy understanding. So when I do more complex topics, it'll make sense of all of that. So this is much easier, slower, easier to follow. Gnosticism in the, is the zombie hit that just won't die. <laughs> that is exactly the truth. All right. The Golden Crusade. <laughs> Complicated handshake. Right, guys, let's, let's begin this. Right, so the original source for this is Dr. David Falk. I saw a video on his channel, which is not very long, and what I did was I used that as a foundation for making these sets of this set of slides. So I go well beyond what he has them what he has shown. Although I did use this as a base. Now I did invite Dr. Falk on twice. I did email him. We did exchange once. Uh, he agreed that he would uh, come on, and then I never heard from him again. But then again, I've emailed a lot of people. Who have never responded to me so that's okay right but let's let's start with this the man is a genuine phd the man has a genuine he's got like i don't know four degrees or whatever the guy is highly qualified so let's start with what he says why i used him and why he is a good person to start with right for his take on the topic so he's got a also a youtube channel you can look him up right so i think it's called egypt and the bible Right, so scholarship, sugge scholarship suggests Gnosticism originated from either competing quote-unquote Christianities or pre-Christian Jewish heresy. Now these views depend on Neoplat well depend upon Neoplatonism as a foundational philosophy to the genesis of Gnosticism. Welcome, Chloe. Good to see you. Right, so a lack of early Neoplatonic textual evidence is a problem that inhibits the Jewish heresy view. Evidence overwhelmingly supports the identity of pre-Christian Gnostic sects. Egyptian theologies provide a set of philosophical constructs and literary traditions necessary for the genesis and development of 1st century BC Gnostic sects. So that's a really good start. It's actually very interesting. So that leads us in a particular direction for the source, the original source of Gnosticism. And that will lead me to something else that I will do in the future called Hermeticism. Its ideas can be traced from the first dynasty through the literary traditions of Egypt until it developed into Gnostic and Hermetic thought in order to inductively provide a more plausible explanation for the development of Gnosticism. So, Nonsensticism. It is confusing, it is complex. So, Gnosticism is confusing, irrational, and widely misunderstood. And yes, hit the like button. If you don't like my talks, hit the like button twice. It is more than a reaction to Christianity. Gnosticism is actively, positively anti-Christian. It's an anti-Christology. It is the product of Egyptian Hermetic and Platonic thought, with roots going back nearly 1,200 years before Christ. Now, this is Hermeticism. In the middle here, you've got Hermes Trismegistus. This man, according to the Abbasids, is an ancestor 
a spiritual as well as probably a legitimate ancestor of Muhammad, right? So he is a god. He's a man that became a god. In Egypt, he's known as Thoth. In the Roman tradition, he's the god Mercury, but he's Hermes, the god Hermes in the Greek tradition. So he's effectively, this is a merger of these individuals as one, right? So he brought the hikama, the wisdom, the knowledge to Islam. So this is something I'll deal with separately another time. But you must understand he is effectively Idris, who's one of the very first, I think the second prophet, discussed or mentioned in the Quran. Now, this talk is intended to gently introduce the topic and to add some new insights to build gradually onto what Gnosticism is. Isn't that the god of the new moon? And yes, you would be correct. Now, do understand the story changes depending on who you ask, when you ask, when you look, and so on, where you ask. This will change because there's nothing static about it. It changes, it modifies, it's like a chameleon, right? Andrew says Hinduism is purely Gnostic as well, and yes. So James Alexander says, I need to shower. I'm going to radio this into the speaker. <laughs> Please refrain from funny comments so I don't have to miss them. Okay, that's... Okay, thanks for sharing, buddy. Thanks for sharing. All right. Now, Islamic law defines Islam as a Gnostic religion. Very important to note. The scholars of Islam in the fiqh do claim to be the true Gnostics. Eric Sampson Daniel, very welcome. It is an ancient enemy of the church and it inspires many heresies. This nonsense is widespread today, even in the church, especially in Protestant thinking. Now, that's a talk I will do in the future, right? But, for instance, what I could do is, is play for you Gnostic preachers, right, who, go to, who preach at Gnostic churches, play some of their sermons, and then ask you, is that a Protestant preacher or is that a Gnostic? In some cases, it is incredibly hard to tell, and you will not be able to tell. They may as well be Baptists, so they may as well be, you pick the Protestant denomination. Understand? Because their terminology is generally not Catholic. This is not to say the Catholic Church has not been affected by this, but it is definitely a problem within the Protestant churches. And the followers of Gnosticism are called nonces. Didn't take too long to link to Islam. Yes, of course, because Islam explicitly states it is a Gnostic religion. They are True Gnostics. They have the true Gnostic knowledge. Is the New Age the new face? Yes, it is definitely one of the faces of Gnosticism. Now, Tilder, duh, it's socialism. In a sense, you know, in a real sense. Because socialism is itself Gnostic. It's all the same. This is a very common refrain. So in philosophy, as distinct from theology, Gnosticism means a dialectic of, which is, well, a strife between an, a a conflict between opposites or contraries, things that are contradictory. Uh, Eva says Islam took all and mixed it in one pot. Yes. So that eventuates in the necessity for a secret knowledge because it fails to make correct distinctions. It doesn't use scholastic, it doesn't use scholastic, systematic scholastic thinking to look for contradictories, to create distinctions and separate definitions. It merges things. So it merges contradictories. So the only way to find your way out of the confusion is a secret knowledge, a knowledge above the mess that you've made because of sloppy thinking. It is very sloppy thinking. A dialectic, when they speak of dialectic, this is a, a method, a logic, Aristotelian dialectic, a logic, a method for finding truth. So you need a secret knowledge or a gnosis to overcome the contradiction. And the opposite of this is methodical scholasticism. In Gnosticism, these opposites that are in strife are part of the larger pantheistic whole. This means that the universe is seen as a unity of opposites, and that these opposites are not really opposed to each other, but are rather complementary parts of a larger whole. For example, light and darkness are not seen as opposing forces. You could substitute that with good and evil. They're not seen as opposing forces, but rather as two aspects of a larger unity. So JPS says, just like Freemasonry, it's about hidden knowledge. We, yeah, we're, If Freemasonry has been either founded by or heavily infiltrated by Islam, then it is certainly Gnostic. Right? Now, hence, evil is good. It's just misunderstood. There is no evil. You'll see people making these statements. However, of course, Christianity is evil. Christianity is not good. So therefore, it is contradictory and it makes no sense. It is irrational. 
Understand? Now, you could say, well, Gnosticism actually teaches, yeah, look, there's about 5 billion different kinds of Gnosticism. It changes, it adapts, it, it is heuristic, it is disputational, it argues, it doesn't want to be wrong. It's a method of also not being wrong. It changed on the daily, right? If you read the old church fathers, they'll tell you these guys were making up new things all the time. So we're, we're going to try and isolate certain patterns which are common, certain common themes. But Gnosticism is what the individual makes up on the fly. Sounds like Taoism or Taoism, yin-yang philosophy. Yes, there will be similarities, but evil doesn't exist. Of course, Joel Thomas. So, except Christianity is evil and the created world is evil. So there is no evil. There's no bad. There's no good. You know, everything is just, everything is one. You just have to understand it. Except Christianity is evil, the church is evil, and the world is evil. So basic differences with Christianity. Gnosticism and Christianity are different in their views of God, Jesus, salvation, and scripture. Gnosticism is a collection of ancient pseudo-biblical religious myths. And I say pseudo-biblical. That taught that the material world is evil and that only a special knowledge of the divine can redeem the human spirit. Gnostics regard the God of Israel and the Father of Jesus as different beings, with the former being a lower and ignorant creator. So the God of Israel is a lower, ignorant creator. Christianity is based on the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, the Supreme Being. Christianity affirms that the God of Israel and the Father of Jesus are one and the same, and that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are the unchanging word of God. Christianity also preached the gospel to all people, unlike in Calvinism where Christianity was preached to some people. But anyway, while Gnostics claim to be the only true believers, the chosen, chosen ones with secret revelation. Gnostics are not true biblical Christians, Tony. That, yeah, that, that is completely a false claim. So, Gnostics. So, well, think about this. So, Gil Bodhitri Gil Gamesh says, How can Plotinus, the founder of Neoplatonism, write a treatise called Against the Gnostics? Well, think about it. How can the Leninists be against, um, you know, other groups? Like there were Leninists that were against other groups of socialists. And the Nazis who were socialists were against the Marxists. So, yeah, it's like my lie is better than your lie and I'll fight you over it. Simple. Because they all claim to know the truth. They all claim to have the truth. So Gnostics believe that salvation comes through spiritual enlightenment and the attainment of knowledge. Christians believe that salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ any sacrifice on the cross. I wonder, did Jesus believe in sola fide? Or did Jesus believe in works? So let me see, was uh, walking around with that cross being whipped and then, um, you know, going through all of that, was that just faith only or was that actually works? Just a question. <laughs> anyway, Gnosticism, a warning from St. Paul. Some Gnostics say that Jesus taught that the world was a prison created by an evil God. For instance, in the first apocalypse of James. The world is guarded by evil archons requiring a secret password. Now, Paul warned Timothy about Gnosticism when he said, O Timothy, guard what is committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge or gnosis. By professing, by professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. So they're saying here that some have strayed from the true Christian way by professing false knowledge. In some versions, this is called science. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. Now, what religion claims that literally everything it does is a science? Yes, Islam. Islam claims that literally everything in it is a science. Or in a different version, you've got you know, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. So this is clearly a heresy, right? He's calling it a heresy. Uh, Ever says, yeah, that cross was not heavy, no effort at all for them to pick up your cross and follow me. It's pick up your cotton and chop it into the bin. Yeah, and uh, just have faith alone, right? So, yeah. So, yeah, why do Momo's followers hate Paul? Yeah, because he calls them heretics. He states they are wrong. Now, when, let's look at Islam again. Religion for the elites. Ulama, these are scholars of almost all disciplines, more specifically the scholars of the religious sciences. Paul warned against those with 
false sciences. Islam is all about false sciences. In Sunni Islam, the ulama are regarded as the guardians, the transmitters and interpreters of religious knowledge of Islamic doctrine and law, embracing those who fulfill religious functions in the community that require a certain level of expertise, the elite, in religious and traditional issues. The allam is often seen as opposed to the adab, he of profane knowledge, so they are the elite. The ulama, to know, to be aware of, so people of knowledge. The term refers more specifically to the scholars of the religious sciences. So these are the Gnostics, the Faqih, the Mufassir, the Mufti, the Muhaddith. These are the Gnostics of Islam. And this is explicit. I've covered this in other talks, especially in the Reliance of the Traveler, where they discuss how Islam is explicitly a Gnostic religion. So Gnosticism is often presented as the version of Christianity that lost. So, actually, no, a little mess here. If you cannot understand Gnostic teachings, it is because only those who are inducted into the mysteries can understand its secrets. So, of course, within within Egypt, you have these mystery ideologies, mystery religions, right? You have these mysteries. And the Muslims, the Sufis, who are these Gnostics, trace their knowledge back to Egypt, right? Don't forget, we started in Egypt. So, these they trace their knowledge back to Egypt. So, Gnosticism is often presented as the version of Christianity that lost in the race of rival Christianities, you can't, there's only one, if there's only one truth, you cannot have rival truths. One of them is wrong, right? Put simply, Gnosticism is a religious system that has as its central tenet salvation through secret knowledge. The only sin within Gnosticism is ignorance. Now, of course, the word ignorance in Islam would be the Jahiliyyah, right? Being in the Jahiliyyah, now, obviously people say that the Jahiliyyah is the time before Muhammad, the time of ignorance before Islam came. That is not true. It is the condition of ignorance. If you're not a Muslim, you are in the Jahiliyyah. You are guilty of the condition of ignorance. Therefore, you don't have the knowledge. You're not an initiate. A general tendency was to be observed among practitioners of the religious sciences to consider a certain knowledge, only knowledge inherited from Muhammad the Prophet albeit with nuances conditioned by their theological orientation. So Muhammad brought the secret knowledge, right? And he got the secret knowledge, according to the Abbasids, through history, he got it from Thoth, the Egyptian god Thoth, or Hermes Trismegistus. So we say here the science par excellence, right? This is from the Encyclopedia of Islam, is that which derives from the prophet. So the greatest science on earth came from the prophet. Okay, so uh, everything's good on my side still. The do's, everything's clear here. All the rest is either useless or does not deserve to be called science. So in other words, according to Islam, science is what Muhammad brought. Science is not what you do when you use proper logic, proper thinking to learn and measure the material world. Science is what Muhammad brought. Muhammad's teachings are science. Understand, they have a very different idea of what science is. And it says that numerous prophetic traditions on the study of science concern only religious knowledge. All other knowledge is useless. So, religious knowledge. Right? And the ulama, according to the Encyclopedia of Islam, have long been seen as a permanent government behind changing dynasties. So, this would mean that they are a secret government. This would mean that they are a deep state. So, understand these are the people with the true knowledge and they've passed this knowledge down and they're the ones that seem to be running things from behind the scenes according to this. So the early church fathers. Now this nonsense is heavily criticized in the writings of the early church fathers, the apostles of the apostles. It is the great rival of early Christian faith appearing roughly at the same time. Pedro Jr. Yes, sounds like a cult. Many believe that Gnosticism died out in the 4th century. Critics of historical Christianity use Nonsensticism as a basis for comparison with Christianity. Much of the historic status of Christianity hinges on the nature of the conflict between early Christians and, nons and nonces. The texts of the Mandaeans, for instance, are the Mandaeans. They, the Mandaeans go back, I think, to the 4th century, and they basically became the Cathars. When you look at the Albigensian Crusade in Europe, 
they continued those ideas. They also would be known as the Sabians, Sabians in Iran. When the Muslims took over Haran in Turkey, just over the border from Syria, they took that secret knowledge with them. They incorporated that, those hermetic ideas, the magic rituals into Sufi Islam. They went to Spain. And that's what the Sufis claimed, that they absorbed the original truths of the Egyptian mystery religions. So the Mandeans have been used by scholars like Rudolf Bultmann, this guy here, who lived from 84 to 1976, to support the thesis of a pre-Christian Gnosticism which influenced the New Testament. So in other words, Christianity is a derivation of Gnostic traditions, these semi-pagan traditions, right? And therefore, it won the race. There was a race, and they Christians won the race. In other words, the short version is the Catholic Church beat everyone else up, oppressed the truth, you know, was incredibly totalitarian and nasty and killed anyone who brought the truth and the Catholic Church is then teaching false Christianity. You get the idea, right? Now, what is odd that this guy was a German Lutheran theologian and a professor of the New Testament at the University of Marburg. And he's stating that Gnosticism created Christianity. Fascinating. Thanks, Martin Luther. Yep, back to this guy again. So yes, yeah, so this guy threw a spanner in the works. Now, this guy was a major figure of early 20th century biblical studies. On the other hand, you've got other scholars like E.M. Yamauchi, the Mandaic Incantation Texts and Pre-Christian Gnosticism, a survey of the proposed evidence. And he says here, Yamauchi, whose dissertation examined the earliest Mandaic texts, concludes that the Mandeans could not have originated before the 2nd century AD. So that's fascinating. Bultmann was obviously talking right out of his butt, right? So whatever his motivations were, we have to ask. But when you're speaking of early 20th century Protestant scholars in Germany, a, a significant number of them were pro-Nazi. A significant number of them lent their weight to the Nazi war machine, to the Nazi ideology. Many of them actually were trying to rewrite, literally did rewrite the New Testament, rewrite the Bible, change Christian theology to adapt to Nazi ideology, to become scientific. They wanted to prove scientific racism and the, the right for the superior man to slaughter all the inferior man and so on. They were making social Darwinism into Christianity. They were justifying Nazism and saying that Nazism is the true Christianity. This is unfortunately the legacy of Lutheran theologians, Protestant theologians in Germany at the beginning of the 20th century. It, it's pretty dark and, and ugly. I'll be talking about that in another session. I'll be talking about a, a guy called Gerhard Kittel. So the Mandaeans did not originate before the second century, so they came after. So in many cases, when atheists, for instance, claim that Christianity got its start from this thing or that thing, they'll be referring to second, third, and fourth century ideas that came hundreds of years after Christianity. But... They claim that these ideas kicked off Christianity. So he suggests that their Gnostic theology, right? So he notes the emphasis upon marriage and procreation, which distinguishes them from the ethics of other Gnostic groups who were often very licentious. So he suggests that their Gnostic theology was transmitted by a migration from Transjordan to Mesopotamia. Odd. Moon worshippers of Mesopotamia. Where this was fused with an indigenous cult from the observation of the many ancient Mesopotamian elements which have been retained in their magic and rites. Someone tell me which book in the New Testament discusses the practice of magic. How Christians should do magic. Magic rituals to maybe, I don't know, <clears throat> set your neighbor's house on fire. <clears throat> if you know of any such book, do let me know, but I'm starting to think this guy has a point. All right, so let me continue here. So it is probably their strong ritual tradition which has enabled the Mandean community to become the only Gnostics to survive to this day. However, they're not the only Gnostics to survive. Islam is also a Gnostic religion. So, Elaine Pagels has her Fifi's hurt. Elaine bought Pagels, right? bought because, you know, she's basically a twin of Bart Ehrman, suggested that there were many, quote-unquote, Christianities running around the landscape and modern Christianity won the war by suppressing Gnosticism. Although the Gospels of the New Testament, like those discovered at Nag Hammadi, are attributed to Jesus' followers, no one knows who actually wrote any of them, she says. Right? She wrote here the Gnostic Gospels. Long buried and suppressed, the Gnostic Gospels contain the secret writings attributed to the followers of Jesus. Yeah, they came 400 years later, but okay, whatever. 
and Beyond Belief, The Secret Gospel of Thomas. Okay, fine, thanks. According to Pagels, the gospel writer's creation of Satan gave rise to the moral history of the West. So the writers of the gospel created Satan. Satan wasn't evil. They could then take that evil, impose it on anyone they didn't like, and then kill them so they could impose Christianity upon the world. Or, well, okay. So this material is painful, she says. It's painful because they suppress the truth. So, in other words, Christians invented evil via morality. That's fascinating. So, yeah. Now, I will note that she seemed to have lost her child. Her child died. Her baby died. And she seemed to be, I'm guessing, this has some impact on her beliefs. Because maybe she's angry at God. Maybe she couldn't rec reconcile the, the idea of the evil of her child dying. But you need to look into Darwin's life as well. Darwin was, Darwin was an emotional wreck. Darwin was affected by the death of his mother. Then his daughter-in-law died, which really deeply affected his son. Darwin was, she was well-liked. Darwin was affected by this. And then Darwin's daughter died. And Darwin just never recovered from that. The Christian idea of Satan led to demonization and then the persecution of others. So we invented Satan because, you see, everything's good. There's only good. It's just misunderstood. Like, I don't know, like, let's say diddling little kitties maybe that's good you know but but we invented morality that said that's bad and then we attacked people who did it and and then we suppressed them because bad so Gamesh says the only way she can make sense of a pain is to demonize god and call him a demiurge like the gnostics very very likely and that's what darwin um i've finished my first section of, well nearly finished my first section on darwin it's going to be an eye opener i think so Darwin wanted to be an Anglican priest late in his life, became an agnostic. No, Darwin was not an agnostic. I, I, Darwin was an outright atheist. For Pagels, there is no difference between nonsensicism and Christianity, right? They are equal Christianities. Now, if you've read anything about Gnosticism, you'll know it's completely contradictory to the Bible. It is utterly antithetical to Christianity, but these people are not making sense because they've lost, they, they've gone off the rails. Yeah. Pedro says, everything is good except Christianity. How does that make any sense? Exactly, it doesn't. It's not intended to make sense. It's it's subjective. Now, notice there's the thing called the Bauer thesis, right? This was made very popular by a guy called Bauer. I think it's Rudolf Bauer uh, or Wilhelm Bauer. I can't remember which one. I'll get to that in the future. And Bart Ehrman. So basically, Bart Ehrman is the prime proponent of the Bauer thesis, which is that Christianity is derived from Gnostic texts. The weird thing is that in the guy's thesis, apparently, he's only using second century Gnostic texts to prove that Christianity is derived from these texts, which is crazy because these texts all, every one, came after Christianity started, which is like idiotic. And then Blot Ehrman and Elaine Pagels like jump on this bandwagon and you're like, huh? So now what I mean is here when she says that they suppress Gnosticism, of course, that Christianity, she means the Catholics suppressed and suppressed the truth. They, they, they killed off their competitors, these, these crazy Gnostics. St. Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon, against heresies on the refutation and overthrow of the so-called Gnosis, or knowledge so-called. Fart Ehrman, very good name. Bart Simpson, yep. So Irenaeus wrote that Christianity was passed down to him from the apostles who knew Jesus personally, while the Gnostics and the Marcionites were distorting the faith. The Gnostics offered salvation through secret knowledge available only to a few, i.e. ignorance is what is evil. There is no evil. The only evil is ignorance. To not know is evil. To not have their knowledge is what is evil. Once you have their knowledge, there is no evil. Well, you'll see that what, what you think is evil is not evil. Yeah, so Pedro says Bonhomme spews nonsense for the masses, but in academia he knows what he says is utter nonsense. I know, it's it's crazy how contradictory he is. Now, Irenaeus contended that the true doctrines of the Christian faith are the same, they are universal, which would mean Catholic. The word Catholic means universal, which are taught by bishops in different areas, right? The same truths that are taught by bishops in different areas, by leaders of the church. Okay, not Brother Bob, but the bishop of the church. While many of the Gnostics viewed the material world as flawed and from which believers sought to escape to an eternal realm of spirit. Now, the realm of spirit is the realm of personal imagination, subjective imagination. And Irenaeus saw creation as good and ultimately destined for glorification. 
And he says, I have spared no pains, not only to make these doctrines known to you, but also to furnish the means of showing their falsity. So shall you, according to the grace given to you by the Lord, prove an earnest and efficient minister to others, that men may no longer be drawn away by the plausible system of these heretics, which I now proceed to describe. And these ideas can be very plausible. They are very, very smart. I mean, they're incredibly good sounding. Specious, but really, really well put together. Right, so Irenaeus, Valentinian, well, Valentinus rather, and St. Paul. Gnostics borrowed the phraseology and some of the tenets of the chief religions of the day, especially Christianity. In other words, they, they share your vocabulary. They took your vocabulary, but they do not share your dictionary. So they're the same words with different meanings. To them, matter was a corruption of the spirit. The whole universe was a deprivation of the deity, with the ultimate end of all being the overcoming of the grossness or the sickness of matter and the return to the parent spirit, a return that they inaugurated and facilitated by the appearance of a God-sent Savior. That's their version of Jesus. Gnostic thought can be broken up into how the world was created, which is called a protology, the nature of God in Christ, called a Christology, and they are all anti-Christologies. They all are contradictory to the biblical view of God. They are pseudo-biblical. Third is the nature and the value of the human being, called theological anthropology. And finally, the end of creation, which is called eschatology. And in Martin Luther's case, just scatology. So yes, Gnosticism very likely is the root of the liberal mindset. So Patrick Ireland says, secret knowledge of God is a contradiction in terms antithetical to Jesus' words in the gospel. Yep, I would say so. So St. Irenaeus battled a form of Gnosticism called Valentinianism. Valentinus, who lived from about 100 to 160, was likely from Egypt, educated in Alexandria. Alexandria was one of the main hubs of heresy. It was one of the great heretical centers of the day. In fact, for hundreds of years, it was one of the major heretical centers. St. Clement of Alexandria traces Valentinus's heritage through Theudas, allegedly a disciple of St. Paul the Apostle, who, according to the Gnostics, had imparted special secret knowledge to Theudas as part of the Pauline inner circle. So, but don't forget though, Paul was a Jew who co-opted and corrupted Christianity according to a certain religion. I can't remember which one. I can never, certain, certain religion that, so these guys can't get their story straight. So, Valentine's Gnostic Eons or the Yalba Oath. So within the Gnostic cosmology, we've got the Ogdoad, the Eight, the Decad, the Ten, and the Duodecad, the Twelve. These are all major spirits. And these make up the pleroma, or the fullness, in Gnonsense cosmology. Right? It's fascinating that you've got this idea of the snake here. Very, very interesting. Right? So, Sophia is the wisdom. Right? Also called Akamoth, the flawed or imperfect wisdom, which consists of spirit, animal, and matter. Right? Spirit, animal, and matter. Her child emanation is the demiurge, a false, evil deity, the creator of the material world, he is the god outside the pleroma, lacking the plur well, he lacks the pleroma's divine essence. So the god of matter lacks the divine essence of the pleroma. He is a false god. And the this god uh, called the demiurge or Yaldabaoth is the creator god Yahweh in Genesis. So the demiurge is a force that keeps the souls trapped in physical bodies imprisoned in the material realm, ignorant, in other words, with no gnosis of their true spiritual nature, right? So in other words, you are a piece of God. You're a piece of the monad that is trapped in matter. It fell into this world when the bad God attacked the good God, hitting him hard, and pieces of the good God broke off and fell. And therefore, by their logic, we are trapped in an evil world made by an evil demon called the God Yahweh of the Bible. And if they kill everyone to return all of those souls back to merge them and reunite them with the monad, that will be good. The name Yaldabaoth or Ialdabaoth is derived from the Aramaic expression Yaldabaot, or in, which is Imperial Aramaic, which means son, child, or descendant of chaos, not of the divine order of the Pleroma. So God is the son of chaos, the child of chaos. 
Isn't Mo a part of the lie in Islam? Yes, he is. Now, look, you can go through Gnosticism, you can go through all these sects, and you'll find a million different stories because every, every initiate who eventually becomes a master, he's required to develop his own theology. So he could make it up as he goes. You see, he would find his own truth. Like, uh, like um, Oprah would say, you know, you must find your own truth. So they would find their own truth. They would make it up. In fact, like if you read like with Irenaeus, he'll say that these Gnostics made it up on their own. They would just make it up. Every day they would change. When someone gave an argument, the next day they would have a completely different story. So they were not consistent. They don't have a complete ideology that is consistent. They just change things every day. Whereas Christianity, the Bible remains consistent. The theology remains consistent. These guys would literally make it up as they went. Patrick Allen, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Your inner truth, Andrew Martin. Yes, exactly. Your inner truth. There is no such thing. There is your perspective. There is your opinion. There is your your view of the truth. But the truth is separate from you. But that's but again, they just dis, they dispute all of these concepts. Every Gnostic was his own Pope and Church. Rusty Shackleford. That was, yeah, yeah. Give that man a prize. Now the undead chameleon. So Gnosticism never died out. It is seductive on many levels, right? Adapting to new religious and cultural contexts, camouflaged in new terms. It's easy if you can make it up as you go, right? Find your own self, accept me for what I am. Everybody should respect. Yeah, exactly. There's no, there are no consistent standards. There are no ultimate standards, right? Isn't that what the LGBT does? Your own truth, correct? Right, so Gnosticism adapts. It is the ultimate chameleon. It, it shapeshifts, it, it morphs, right? So it is the ultimate transformer, if you will, and it always camouflages itself in new terms. So the success of nonsensicism lies in the fact that it is infinitely adaptable. There have been Zoroastrian, Mandian, and several sects of pseudo-biblical Jewish and Christian nonsensics, right? So understand this thing is able to change and camouflage into any environment. It retains certain core ideas, and we will later explore what these core ideas are. So they will maintain these core ideas, but they will camouflage the externals with these, with these characteristics of the given time and geography. It survived through early modern Europe as hermetic thought and survives into modern times. For that, I need to one day do some research on Italy because a lot of weird things happen in Italy from like the 11th, 10th, 11th century through to the 16th century. So some weird things were going on there. A lot of that stuff impacted heavily. So you've got to go into the Medicis and their libraries and and so on. So th they brought Hermeticism back into Europe. They created a, a, a they, they, yeah, anyway, moving on. There is probably more Gnosticism today in the world than at any time in the past 2000 years. So understand Gnosticism is alive and well today. It was not defeated. It has simply changed language. It has cloaked itself. It, is, it has infiltrated the church heavily, but it survives today. While Christianity emerged from 1,400 plus years of Israelite religion, Gnosticism emerged from 1,200 years of Egyptian Hermetic religion. Now, some useful sources you might want to read here are Egyptology, the oldest Yahweh inscription, Associates for, Bib for Biblical Research. You can find, if you don't like that organization, you can go find others, which talks about the oldest Yahweh inscription, right? And then you can look at the Solob inscription, the earliest discovered use of the name Yahweh. Right, I use this one. You, there's plenty of them. I just grabbed these because the articles were decent. So, <clears throat> and then of course you've got the land of the Shasu of Yahweh. Shasu means nomads or maybe those who move on foot. And this is about 70 years after Moses, roughly 1,446 BC. Right, so that's how how far back Israelite religion goes. Our first knowledge of Yahweh as the God of the the of if not the Israelites themselves, of a group who adopted the Israelite religion within that geography. Let's look at Carl G. Jung and Gnostic psychology. You've got the Gnostic Jung, so you've got this, and the search for roots, C.G. Jung and the tradition of Gnosis, Alfred Ruby. So yeah, modern Gnostics. Gnosticism, together with alchemy, was for C.G. Jung the chief prefiguration of his analytical psychology. Alchemy, okay, that's an Islamic practice, which made its way into the medieval Middle Ages. Right, so this is now, and so now you've got this leaning towards magic, right? Jung did not simply interpret Gnostic texts psychologically, but Jung cited Gnosticism as confirmation of his psychology 
So the man was an out-and-out -out Gnostic. In other words, detached from reality. He was, you can call him a wizard. You can call him someone who's doing ritual magic. But this is not based on anything in reality. Do you understand how deep this has gone and how we have taken people that we regard as and revere as great scholars, you know, saints in science and so on. And these people are just mm, at least two sandwiches short of a picnic. An authority on theories of myth and Gnosticism, Robert Siegel, has searched the Jungian corpus to bring together in one volume Jung's main discussions of this ancient form of spirituality. That's the book here, the Gnostic Jung. Included are both Jung's soul work devoted entirely to Gnosticism called Gnostic Symbols of the Self and his own Gnostic myth, Seven Sermons to the Dead. Yep, he did his own Gnostic writing. The man was a Gnostic. The Gnostics are not rational. But this is Jung, so can we trust a single word the man said? Can we trust his science? Despite being called Jung, <laughs> his ideas are very old, yeah, and, and completely nuts. <clears throat> Eva says, I don't know if I should laugh or cry. I know, I know, it's like, I just want to scream at the screen half the time. Yeah. So, Jung saw Gnosticism as a precursor to his understanding of the collective unconscious, which he believed contained universal symbols and archetypes that are shared across cultures and individuals. So yeah, this man was heavily steeped in Gnosticism. Understand the dangers here. All the New Age circles appreciate Jung, exactly, because this is simply legitimization of magic. It is legitimization of irrationality. It is legitimizing ideas that have no basis in reality. Right, mindless cosmos. Matter without meaning. The word cosmos is very, very interesting. Um, yeah, the word cosmos implies a world without a god, matter, just, just matter. So, which is interesting that, that, that Carl Sagan called his series Cosmos, right? Because it's, it's, it actually has a connotation that God is dead. So, Shvilibis says, makes sense in being Gnostic. Now, I'm sad. Yeah, no, you should, man, yeah. Uh, when I do Darwin, actually, when, when I do my talk on Darwin, okay, I'll show that later. You're going to be surprised by what I'll have to tell you. I think it's going to leave you, if not shocked, right? It's going to be deeply surprising. Okay, so... So I'm going through it at a very slow pace this time on this one, okay? I want to take it easy because when you go beyond this, it gets very complex. It gets really technical. So I want to create a, an easygoing introduction step-by-step step to give us to bring us up to speed. Like I said, you can pick up Gnostic Book A and it's going to have different ideas to this. And Gnostic Book B agrees and the Gnostic Book C has a mixture of the others. But there are certain core ideas, Right. So, before we discuss what nonsense, well, what nonces believe, let's see how, nonce, how nonces view the cosmos and creation. Much of what Gnostics believe stems from their cosmology. For, nonce, for nonces, in the beginning was a god of pure light called Albert. Okay? And that secret knowledge I'm giving you right here, right now. The monad, the Gnostic monad, the, the original god of creation was called Albert. Okay? So, in the beginning was a god of pure light called Albert, the monad. Albert is not a creator, but a mindless emanator. Secret knowledge, people. Secret knowledge. You heard it here first. It's because I'm here for you guys. The monad created more gods called eons, but these eons had less light than Albert. Yes, the almighty Albert. Yes. The eons then created more gods with even less light not Frank. No, it's, it's Albert. Sorry, sorry, guy. It's, it's Albert. This cascade continued until a god was created that had almost no light and was almost pure. E Trevor. You know what? I, you know, maybe it was Trevor, but I don't think so. That's, that's far too masculine and modern a name, Mick. So it's definitely Albert. So this cascade continues until a god is created that had almost no light and was almost pure evil. This god was called the Demiurge, a Greek term that means craftsman. In other words, a maker god. Big Al. Okay, so that's Big Al. That's the story of Big Al. This is based on the Platonic notion of forms or ideas. Thank you, Sheikh Boyardi. <laughs> oh, Atex says, it's Albert. You crashed my dreams with this nonsense. Well, it's about nonsense. I'm allowed to talk nonsense. I can make it up as well. But good for the goose is good for the gander, right? So this is based on the platonic notion of forms or ideas. <laughs> Patrick Allen, I just spilled my coffee. Thanks. Welcome. 
Big Al and his little pal. Chef <laughs> Verdi. Big Al and his little pal. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So it's so meaning. So this cascade, okay. So this so this is based on the platonic notion of, of forms or ideas. Meaning if we have a shape in the physical world, there must also be a perfect shape in the spiritual world. So it is a so any shape that you have has a perfect form, perfect version represented in the spiritual world. And yeah, I say Albert, but it might also be Cecil. The records are unclear. So it's Albert or Cecil. Uh, just let me know in the chat if you think the name is Albert or Cecil. Uh, based on the majority vote, I guess I'll change his name. Okay. So just let me know, Albert or Cecil. So Plato's perfect forms. Now, of course, you'll notice here, Muslims are going to say he was a Muslim. Look, he's making the Tawhid symbol. Okay, so Plato's perfect forms, right? Plato lived from 427 to 347 BC, right? He was a student of Socrates. His theory of forms or his theory of ideas said that all life forms represent an imperfect replica of a perfect Eugene. Eugene. Uh, someone's voting for Al. You get. <laughs> Is this the comedy gold channel? <laughs> uh, um, and the problem with that is. Uh, I thought it was Clyde. Matty says, I thought it was Clyde. There's so many good names, guys. Um, yeah, my, my, my secret knowledge only came up with, my secret research only came up with Albert or Cecil, but maybe it was Clyde. Who knows? Who knows? It's Uncle Albert, according to Knight of Christ. Uncle Albert. Yeah, okay, fine. I mean, you know, we can all just call him what we like, right? It's all just shades of gray, right? So all life forms represent an imperfect replica of a perfect eternal him. Tim is too just Tim. No, maybe hell. I don't know. Who knows? But Timmy's already taken. I think you know. Timmy's funny. Let's leave Timmy alone, right? So, <laughs> so an imperfect replica of a perfect, eternal, unchanging spiritual model in a higher reality. So the Gnostic spirit world was called the Pleroma. It is more real than the physical world, or does it just identify as more real, right? The form of the spirit world is a more real existence than that of the physical world, okay? So apparently, somehow, this spiritual world is more real than the physical world. This Now, notice, if you think of, think of, um, think of Star Wars, where Yoda tells Luke, you are not physical matter, you are... A spiritual being of light. Think about it at, on the, the, the on the swamp planet, right? Those ideas, many of the ideas within the Star Wars universe are based on Gnosticism, to give them a religion, right? So that I so this idealized form exists on a higher spiritual plane. You can even go up to higher planes of existence. There is a perfect form, for instance, of a chair, which all physical chairs in the world try to replicate but can never fully achieve. Right? The physical chairs we see are imperfect copies of the perfect form of a chair. These forms lead up to one ultimate form, right? So everything in this physical world has a perfect replica, has a perfect form in the spiritual world. And everything in the physical world cannot reach the perfection of that in the spiritual world. But all of these forms are just are related to one perfect form, the one ultimate form. And all of these forms stem from that one ultimate form called Albert, right? Or the monad. This principle of form or ideas can also be... But have a look. Now notice, I asked you guys, is it called Albert or Cecil? Not one of you guys chose Cecil, right? But besides that, you all came up with your own name. Think about it. I gave one or two choices and we've had like 20 different versions of a name. And that's Gnosticism. Everyone can find his own truth. That is not truth. That is opinion. I told you it's Albert or Cecil, right? Probably Albert. You guys said, well, maybe it's Jane. Maybe it's John. Maybe it's Mark. Maybe it's Timothy. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's Gaylord, whatever. But think about it. You are being Gnostics. You have now made up your own truth. Do you understand how this works? Do you understand? That's Gnosticism. You've just shown it in practice. With your Gnosis, you came up with a name that suited your subjective preferences, your feelings, not based on, do you understand? You make it up 
what suits you. Do you understand? That's Gnosticism. That's exactly what it is. The unlikely Catholic says, my training for my ministry degree in the 2000s was through a word of faith Bible school and I was taught that the spiritual world is more real. I used to teach that as well. <laughs> Did I assume his name? Well, I assumed his gender as well. Albert. Okay. So this principle form or ideas can also be extended to people or gods. Okay. So it's not just physical things. We can extend this idea of principle forms to people or gods as well. And when, they, when extended to gods, the gods are called eons or the hypostasis, right? So the implications of Plato for morality, right? So hopefully that makes sense. I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to make this as simple and as understandable and as logical. Is this working, guys? Is this, I mean, it's step by step. I'm trying to make it sequential and simple without the complexity so that you can follow along and then try to understand all of these, these historical things. So this is a basis on which later on we will build far more complex things. Thanks, Eva. Electrostatic, thanks. <clears throat> Everything is relative. The woke cult, Natalie Stag. Yes, exactly. Right? Being Gnostic is not understanding what Homer Deus means because you don't speak Latin. <laughs> Patrick Island, it's Goldloid. Thank you. No, thank you very much, guys. Um, so Rusty Shackelford said, this is why the Gnostics hate Christianity because the perfect form, the monad, entered the material attaching it to him. How can perfection be part of imperfection? Exactly. What are Cecil's pronouns? Oh my gosh, I have no idea. Okay, now, implications of Plato for morality. So Plato's theory has profound implications for metaphysics. Metaphysics is the branch of philosophy that deals with the fundamental nature of reality. The physical world that we perceive is constantly changing and imperfect. However, the world of forms is unchanging and perfect. His pronouns are mo and nad. <laughs> mo and nads, yeah. Okay. However, the world of forms is unchanging and perfect, right? Whereas the physical world is changing and imperfect. So Plato asks, is it the ever-changing physical world that we experience, or is it the eternal and the perfect realms of forms that we experience, right? So I hope you guys have taken a moment to hit the like button and do tell your friends about it, do share and subscribe. And... Um, yeah, and also please learn this, use it, take screenshots, share it, and uh, yeah. Okay, so let's see. In terms of epistemology, wow, thanks, Sheikh Biardi. Out of all the Islamic researchers, Lloyd is one of my favorites. He constantly does a great job. Thank you very, very much. I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. XYZ, thank you for the support. You're always there for me. Andrew Martin, all the great comments. We experience the physical world. The realm of forms is simply nonsense. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So in Sufi Islam, Muhammad is the monad. No, in Sufi Islam, Muhammad is Muhammad is the emanation of... No, he's not the emanation. Muhammad is a part of Allah, made of the same essence. Muhammad is John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So in the Sirah, the Gospels of Muhammad, the biographies as they say, Muhammad is made from a piece of Allah. Allah takes a piece of himself and makes Muhammad. So, okay. So in terms of ep epistemology, which is the study of knowledge and how we acquire it, Plato's theory suggests that true knowledge is in the realm of the forms, not in the physical world. So we're not here in the physical world where we live in the real. Here's not where knowledge is, right? The physical world is a realm of appearances, of illusions, and true knowledge can only be accessed through reason and contemplation of the forms. Now, reason, fine and well, okay? And contemplation, thinking upon, but then <sighs> variations of reason, definitions of reason can vary, right? This challenges sensory perception as the primary source of knowledge. In other words, don't trust your senses and emphasizes the importance of rationality and intellectual inquiry. Well, rationality by what standard? Reason by what standard? So Muhammad takes the place of the Logos of God, aka, yes, he does. Exactly. If you read through the Sirah, if you watch my talk, I did a talk on the Kennedy Report um, last Tuesday. And I should be doing one live tomorrow at, at 5.30 uh, Warsaw time tomorrow, which is 11.30 Eastern Standard, and 4.30 UK time tomorrow, I'll be talking about something else, Islam and occultism and the KKK and Freemasons. But last week I did a talk on that topic, uh, dealing with Muhammad as Jesus. So I did that last week in the Kennedy Report. Harriel Johnson, thank you very much. I'm really grateful, very much appreciative. All right, so anyway, this challenges sensory perception. So in other words, we cannot believe our senses. We can only believe in this, whatever we imagine, the world of spirit to be, right? This world of forms. Our 
because the external world is illusion, right? This challenges central perception as the primary source of knowledge, and it emphasizes rationality and intellectual inquiry, okay? So the, what are the implications for ethics? So in questions of morality, how we should live our lives, right? So the forms are the ultimate source of moral values and ideals. Well, so if we applied into this little internet of forms, I mean, are we hearing the voices or are we getting something genuine? For example, the form of the good, is the ultimate standard of goodness and provides a basis for ethical judgments and actions. But like Andrew Martin said earlier, if it's fake, you're just hearing the voices in your head. You're just hearing what you want to hear. You're hearing your own thoughts, your own willfulness, your own interests, your own self-interest. So this suggests that moral values are not subjective or culturally determined, but rather grounded in the objective reality of the forms, which is an interesting point though, that that does align with Christian theology that morality is not subjective. It is objective. It is based on the moral law of God because God is the Logos. God is good. Therefore, it is eternal and unchanging. So there are certain similarities here and there are certain things which, according to Christian doctrine, is heretical, in error, or false, and so on. Now, Plato's theory of forms had a lasting and wide-reaching cultural influence. It provided a comprehensive framework for understanding the nature of reality, for knowledge, and ethics. Right. So we take what is true in the history of thought and we absorb those based on a particular framework that would be scholastic thinking, right? As opposed to just absorbing everything, trying to smash it together and making a soup. Right? Now, the Gnostic cosmosogyny. Let's have a look at the Gnostic cosmosogyny. Notice Luciferian Gnosis. And here you've got supposedly an angel, but then here you've got Lilith and the snakes. Look here at this. Look her standing between the snakes. Now, of course, you can go into medicine and you would say that medicine because Hermes Trismegistus also brought the world medicine. And this symbol is also part of that of Hermes Trismegistus, which I mentioned in the beginning. That is Thoth, the god of wisdom, the Egyptian god of wisdom. And here it's a satanic symbol. She is a demon. Right? So, so now the... So, in Plato's philosophy, the demiurge is the divine craftsman or the creator responsible for shaping and organizing the physical world based on the eternal forms or ideas. So he's not a Gnostic, right? He's talking about this, and the Gnostics obviously take some of the ideas, they mutilate the rest. Emerald tablet nonsense, yes, Mick. So the Demiurge acts as an intermediary between the transcendent realm of the forms and the imperfect material world. So that's his view of the Demiurge, right? That's the Platonic view of the Demiurge, the the craftsmen created deities are part of the Egyptian religious milieu. So these craftsmen, these demiurges, are part of an Egyptian milieu, which is very interesting for us. For example, Kanum created mankind on a potter's wheel out of clay. The serpent coiling the stick was the symbol of Asclepius, the Greek god of medicine. But yes, it's also that of Thoth and that of Hermes Trismegistus from Egypt. So, James Alexander asks a very good question. I haven't thought about that. Do you think the Islamic golden tablet Quran in heaven comes from the emerald tablet nonsense? You know, I'd say this. Look, I cannot give you a definitive answer. I don't know because I, I have a lot of notes I have to get to it's, at some point. I've collected the notes. I have not looked into them, but that could be probable. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't simply, I wouldn't reject it out of hand. That, that could well be probable, yeah. As each of the gods is created, sparks fly up. So he's making mankind, and as he makes the gods, the sparks fly up. The sparks of light become angels. The angels are the eons. Sparks of darkness become demons. Some unfortunate sparks become trapped against their will in human bodies. And the weakest sparks become trapped in the most corrupt bodies, which is those of women. So if you've had a hard time with women, guys, now you know why. Now you know why. The weakest sparks become trapped in the most corrupt bodies, which is those of women. That's why I said it's the Gnostic cosmosogyny. And I want you to have a close look here, okay? I want you to look at this half moon symbol, right? Then you the staff and the twisted snakes. And of course, the uh, as above, so below, the hermetic idea. And this is the Baphomet. Right? This is the Eliphas Levi version of Baphomet. But notice this version. And I want you to look closely. You see, the Baphomet has a, let's use a scientific word, a pole and boobies. Okay? Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? 
Okay. So let's have a look here. Right? Transcending duality is realizing God and Satan are the same entity, you. That's a legit message. Jesus and Satan, the same deity, and that's you. All right. Now, Gnostic synchronism, syncre syncretism versus scholasticism. I'm going to try to do 28 slides, but I've gone for an hour. I don't want to go more than an hour 15 on this one. So I was hoping to go 28 slides. But So syncretism is a philosophy that blends or merges contradictory ideas. Right? And often, so syncretism is a philosophy that blends or merges contradictory ideas. Now, think of the word transgender. Okay? Transgender. Transformed trans woman okay transformed woman a woman transformed right syncretism is a philosophy that blends or merges contradictory ideas often hidden behind the sophist term a complex or nuanced understanding when you start to hear that's a complex or nuanced understanding that is usually sophistry designed to hide a gnostic syncretism a blending of good and evil a blending of contraries a blending of opposites Right, which is a destruction of the truth. It is, it it goes against the first law of logic, which is the law of identity. That opposite things are opposite things. Wow! Thank you, Daniel Alvarez. Keep up the great work, brother Lloyd. Thank you very much. Okay, so this blending results in the merging of good and evil, the merging of two irrational contradictories. Right, making it harder to distinguish between the two, or even eliminating evil as a distinct concept. It removes distinctions. Understand? This syncretism removes distinctions. The issue is we need to be able to judge. We need to be able to make distinctions. We need to discern. Uh, what did Andrew Martin say that I missed? Her? Did drag queen with a male beard and female dress? Yes. All right, Patrick Allen, thank you. So now the scholastic philosophical approach, and I will state here that Protestant scholasticism is not Catholic scholasticism, though the two are worlds apart. Protestant scholasticism, as I have discussed in the past, has more in common with Islamic adab al-jadal, which is the Islamic method of disputation of, of sophist lying and rhetoric, than it does with Protestant scholasticism as comes as comes from Aquinas and Aristotle. Please understand there is a difference. Okay? So the scholastic philosophical approach focuses on logical analysis and reasoning to understand complex concepts, including contradictories. Right? Yeah, guys, please use lowercase because if you don't use if you use if you use capitals, my bot will delete the message. Okay? So please use lowercase. Uh, don't use all caps. My my bot takes an action on that. It aims to discern and differentiate between various ideas and concepts such as good and evil. So the whole point of logic is to create distinctions, whereas syncretism is to blend distinctions, to merge and destroy distinctions, and thus destroy the concept of evil. It is to merge things and thus destroy rationality, in effect. The cosmic whirlpool. Choose Albert. Rather go to Albert than fall into the whirlpool. <clears throat> So that's why they're saying there are no differences between men and women, nothing exactly. Yes. So corrupt female bodies left the nonces with the problem of how women can be saved. Now below the earth is a whirlpool with souls that are too wretched or too lost to, do, to become women, who can't be reached with the gnosis, right? Who are too far gone to be reached with the gnosis, who are beyond the help of the Gnostics, right? Or who die without the help of the Gnostics, are tossed into. So that's the whirlpool that you are tossed into if you just are too wretched or far gone. Particularly in the teachings of Valentinus, the Gnostic we came across earlier that Irenaeus fought against. He's from the second century. Kennedy report. Wow, thank you. This is my top three favorite channels. Thank you very much, Kennedy. I'm very really grateful that you're here. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate that, that you're here. So Islam and Gnosis. So I'll go a few more slides, right guys? I won't go too much longer. So Muhammad said, I looked into the hellfire. The majority of its dwellers are women. Hold on. Gnostics were wondering what to do with these women who are the lowest of the low, who are the worst of the worst. Remember, the most corrupt bodies are those of women, right? The weakest and the worst are women. And then Muhammad tells us, I looked into the Halfa, the majority of its dwellers were women. Was he a Gnostic? That's in Da'if Bukhari, book 81, Hadith 38, and book 67, Hadith 131. Now, I will note that Muslims constantly, constantly come in the comments, that's a Da'if Hadith 
brother, you can't use it. It's Daif. And like, I'm like, I'm really, really shocked how little Muslims know about their own religion because that's a joke. Daif Bukhari is a joke. It's it's Sahih. It's Sahih Bukhari. I'm saying Daif as a joke because Muslims are constantly saying that it's Daif. So now they speak here of reading works that are beyond one's understanding or capacity. Now, these are the scholars in the Sharia. These are the these are the the um, the scholars, right? Saying in the fiqh, okay. So the spiritual station of annihilation, of annihilation in Gnostic vision. So understand. So now they speak of the Gnostics have Gnostic vision, the spiritual station of annihilation, the destruction of the self, so that you merge with the greater self, with Albert. So you merge with Albert, right? And they speak of stopping at the first traces of Gnosis. This is in the reliance of the traveler. This is the most common, most popular Islamic law manual, and speaks of Islam being Gnostic. Andrew Martin says, it is Christianity that elevates women. Thank you. Well done. Now, others claim to have attained to gnosis, to nonsense, and contemplative knowledge of the divine, to have passed through the spiritual stations and states, and to have reached nearness to Allah. They say others, you know, but us Christians, we, sorry, us Muslims, sorry, no, us Muslims, we found the true nonsense. We found the nonsense, not those other people. And they say here, our hearts are aflame with the love of Allah, the Most High, and we have attained to nonsense. So understand, Muslims here are insisting, the scholars, the highest scholars in Islam, the most highly qualified and educated, are stating Islam is a Gnostic religion, and the knowledge of Allah is Gnosis. The Gnostic in the first of his states is strongly affected by the initial impact. The Gnostic's spiritual will exalted above all else. The Gnostic relies on the spiritual will, the spirit, the world of spirit, not the world of matter. We have reached the level of those to whom the unseen is disclosed and who have Gnostic insight. The scholars of Islam are the great Gnostics. They have the great nonsense. They've reached the nonsense. They've got the ultimate nonsense, right? The door of Gnosis. So we have traveled to the door of Gnosis, the knowledge. They sniff the first traces of this knowledge, the nonsense. So understand, Islam is entirely Gnostic. The sea, we are immersed in the sea of Gnostic inst inspiration, the Mukashafa. Again, Islam, right? Islam and Gnosis, the tenets of faith that are comprehended through the Gnosis. Islam is so obviously influenced by Christian heresies, Gnosticism, Arianism. Have you heard of Mandeism and its connection? I just mentioned Mandeism earlier in this presentation. I've discussed it at length. And I have also have discussed how Mandeism is linked to the Albigensian heresy, or what's known as the Cathars, as well as to Sabianism. And I've, I've done it at length. Um, all right, so understand Gnosticism is Islamic, Islam is Gnostic. This is admitted in the Ghaib. The Ghaib, yeah, electrostatics is the, the Ghaib, correct. It is the Ghaib. So, okay, let's see late in this comment, but recall the liberal media is always explaining to we plebs how the major Democrat candidates view a major always nuanced. Yes, exactly, that's why it's, it's always a nuanced view. That just means sophistry, it means syncretism, it means Gnostic. It's simple. Things are contradictory, so they need to be defined as such. This means that they're going against the scholastic view. They are violating, they're literally violating the three laws of logic, the pillars of logic, starting with the law of identity. If the material world is evil, then what is the position on the resurrection since it's making, it doesn't have to make sense. Look, at, you're trying to want to make sense out of something that is irrational. It cannot make sense. It doesn't make sense. All right, now let's look at Gnostics. Male-female distinction is a corruption. Five minutes more, right? <clears throat> The distinction between men and women should be rejected because it is part of the useless creation order. Understand? Removing the distinctions, merging things together, making a soup. And it's part of the useless, evil order of creation. That's why you must reject male and female categories. Do you understand now? Transgender. The ideal is androgyny, a synthesis of male and female. Do you understand why we had Baphomet with his little gear shift and his boobies? And so, neither one nor the other. That goes against the the, the basic original pillar of Aristotelian non-contradictory logic, the law of identity. Remember that, all right? The outworking of this ranges from goddess worship to saying women need to become men to be saved. But the common theme is seeing the male-female distinction as defective. Part of the fallen world of death, we must escape if we are to find true life. If you look at the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, now remember, Elaine Pagels, whatever her name was, I mentioned her earlier, right? And I showed her book on the, the Gospel of Thomas. And she's saying that's the original Christianity. This woman has a head so far up her ass, she is starting to see daylight through her tonsils. Okay, let's have a look at what the Gospel of Thomas says. 
When you make the male and the female one and the same, so that the male not be male, nor the female male, then you will enter the kingdom of heaven. Understand? These ideas go way back. Transgenderism is Gnosticism. Whereas in the Bible, male-female distinction is God's design. Genesis 1.27 says, In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So God made men and women as different and interdependent. They are equal, but not the same. Each sex has its own distinct role. See, distinctions versus removing distinctions and just making it soup. Right. Simon Peter said to him, this is the full quote of verse 114. Oh, the Quran has 114 chapters and the Gospel of Thomas has 114 chapters. <laughs> Crazy, or verses. Simon Peter said to him, let Mary leave us for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. So, do you see now the Gnostic root of transgenderism? Right? It is completely irrational. This is, this is what we get. Once you leave behind rationality, this is what you get. So... Okay, let us continue. So, modern cases. Yeah, let's not talk about Judaism. I'm not, I don't want to get into that topic right now. Let's just stay on topic for that. The Gospel of Thomas Cain contains 114 supposed sayings of Jesus, and the modern Quran has 100, 114 chapters. You should also know that the word surah in the Quran means degree. I know we use the word chapter. It actually means degrees, 114 degrees. There's another, there's another organization that also uses degrees. It has 33 of them. Know of, know of such an organization? See, surah is a degree. We use the word chapters in English. Remember I said they, 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 they hide these things in, in language. They cloak themselves. They camouflage. The masons, yes. So the Quran is 114 degrees. Right, so Sophia and the Fall blame the women. I'll go a few more minutes. Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, right? That's where I got some of this anyway. Freemasonry, correct. In, in nonsensicism, the material world is a result of a primordial error or mistake made by a divine being, often referred to as Sophia or Logos. Sophia is the final emanation of a divine hierarchy called the Pleroma, or the fullness, at the head of which is the supreme God, the one beyond being. When you read, for instance, Al-Ghazali, you'll come, they'll be talking about the God beyond being and so on. The error of Sophia is usually identified as a reckless desire to know the transcendent God. She leads to the creation of her desire in the form of a semi-divine, essentially ignorant creature known as the Demiurge, or the Greek Demiorgos, or craftsman, responsible for the formation of the material cosmos. Right? And then, of course, yeah, we come to this topic here. The Demiurge's craftsmanship is an imitation of the realm of the Pleroma. You can see now they are taking, they are stealing, they are borrowing from Plato's theory of forms. But the Demiurge is ignorant of this, right? He's ignorant of the Pleroma. And in hubris and ignorance, he declares himself the only existing God. So the God Yahweh thinks he is the only existing God. This is known as, so in other words, there are many gods. This is known as polytheism or the belief in parrots. Okay, I've got a picture here to help you guys in case, in case some of you don't know what polytheism is. Now here, the Gnostic revisionary critique of the Hebrew scriptures begins, right? They reject this world as a product of error and ignorance, and the post and they, they posit a higher world to which the human soul will eventually return. So Sophia the wisdom is reckless and erode and erred, yes, because she wanted to create, she wanted to be like God. See, she wanted to do what God did, and she created this fake God, who then went and made the mistake of the world. So they forbid people. So Surah 9 is the final degree. Yes, you can view it like that. You can certainly see it in that sense. Right? So they forbid people to marry. 1 Timothy 4.3. So final slide. 1 Timothy 4.3. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So King James Version. Okay, that's the original Bible from the first century. All right? Uh, Jesus left 11 copies with the um, with the with the original apostles, all right? So 1 Timothy 4.3, as people say, if this was good enough for St. Paul, it is good enough for us. 
Now, this verse is part of a larger passage where the Apostle Paul is addressing false teachings and instructions given by certain individuals within the early Christian communities. So this Gnostic idea, these heresies, sprang up in the beginning. The Old Testament God had created the evil physical world, hence he himself is evil and a deceiver. The body is evil and to be treated harshly by fasting. But sexual immorality is fine because it breaks the law of the evil creator. However, marriage is forbidden because marriage will lead to children. Children brings more evil into the world. Which of the Gospels? That was I was speaking about the Gospel of Thomas, a Gnostic text. So, marriage creates more vile flesh by having children, which is evil, and women who give birth will be hindered from entering Gnostic heaven, because women are evil, women are weak. Eve is worshipped as a perfect spirit being, Adam's creator, and united with the serpent, the enlightener of mankind with the true knowledge, which is completely backwards theology. Christ, being perfect, did not have a physical body. He only appeared to have one. Salvation is by your pure spirit, escaping your vile body and ascending to heaven. But your body is an illusion. Reality is an illusion. Escape is by special knowledge or nonsense or nonsense. So yes, a perversion of the good practice of fasting. It's perver- For instance, people say, well, look, you know, these guys are ascetics. These guys, they fast. They don't have sex. And these guys are licentious and they, they screw everybody and they wife swap and they, they say these people are completely different. No, they're actually following exactly the same religion, right? They're just expressing it differently because both of these are either a repudiation, a rejection, or a corruption, or going against the law of God. So God says, for instance, marriage is good. So these guys go and screw everybody licentiously because that is because whatever God said, they must break those rules because God's laws are evil and therefore you must do the opposite. And the guys who take themselves out of the world as the ascetics, they deny God. They don't participate in God's world. God's world. So the one is a lack of partic- participation in the world of God and the rules of God, re- rejecting them, not participating. The others break them. Because either way, what God said and what God wants is evil. Therefore, do the opposite. They're just different ways of expressing the exact same idea, rejection of the Logos, rejection of God. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. So understand this is in the world. So ascetics are Gnostics, right? Those who are licentious and are corrupt, fleshly, if you want to, they are also Gnostics doing the same thing. <clears throat> so, final slide, guys. So, there are eight commonalities within Gnosticism. Eva, yes, it is crazy. So, Albert, so yeah, so guys, uh, we're going to have to say goodbye to Albert after this slide. This is my final slide. All right. So, there are basically eight rough commonalities in Gnosticism or nonsense. Uh, Ebionites, Gnostics, too. Yes. So, the first one is henotheism. Eight concepts are common across many Gnostic groups. While by no means universal, these are eight commonly shared beliefs. The first is that the Gnostic idea of God is a hierarchical henotheism, and the creator God was called the Demiurge. Gnostics believe that there are many gods in the universe, but they only owe worship or allegiance to one. That allegiance is never to the God of the Bible. It is never to the Demiurge, to Yahweh of the Old Testament. Within the pantheon, all the Gnostic gods are fundamentally equal except for the amount of light they contain, with Albert having the most light. So, the Gnostics do not owe worship or owe allegiance to the Albert, who has the most light. Gnostics can pledge allegiance to eons, right? And these eons can specialize in wisdom, like Hermes Trismegistus. They can specialize in truth, or light, or repentance, or they can give their allegiance or worship to personalities such as the Messiah or to Christ or to Jesus. Notice they're three different things. Or to Yahweh or to Adonai or to fill in the blank, Mickey Mouse. Okay? So this is what henotheism is. It's like polytheism, which is the worship of parrots. So understand this makes very little sense. And I think they might now understand this idea conflicts directly with Judeo-Christian monotheism. So effectively speaking, Gnostics are pantheists, but they're also effectively polytheists. So guys, I will leave it there. This is the end. Did I see any comments that I missed? Did I miss any comments that I have not seen, rather? 
Uh, is there a limit to the number of souls? I don't know. Some Gnostics will maybe believe that. I have no idea. So look, I, I went through this slowly. I, I try to go through this methodically to, to introduce this in a simple fashion rather than my more complex things. But hopefully you've learned a lot now about, about um, Gnosticism, about the nonsense, about nonsense. And I will build on this, so we'll probably do, I'll do another show like this probably in a week, and then I'll hopefully start working on the second part of this, and then it gets far more complex. It gets very complex and intense. But yeah, these are not Christians by any means. So Rusty, it's funny because Jesus is identified as Sophia, God's wisdom, and he was a carpenter, a craftsman, demi so they were condemning Jesus. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, it's it doesn't make sense. It's nonsense. So guys, thank you. I hope you've learned something. I hope I didn't miss too many of the chats. And thank you very much for the support from the guys in the chat. Um, thank you, Kennedy, for, for showing up. I appreciate the, um, you know, being here and uh, watching. Um, so Harriel, Patrick, I am a warrior. XYZ, Pedro, the Greek name I cannot pronounce because I have no idea. Matty, Matthias Alexander, Lazar Boyic, have more kids? Yes, definitely. Scrunchy, Andrew Martin, Vegetal, Mick, um, uh, Harriel, I've said already, Rusty, Everyone else, um, uh, horse, of course, and um, camarade. So, guys, thank you all very much for being here. And I will see you guys tomorrow, hopefully, if it's live on the Kennedy Report. But So, take care, guys. Thank you very much. Good night.